More than a week after the diplomatic row started between India and Canada, there is no evidence in the public domain yet to substantiate Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's allegations against India. External Affairs Minister S. Jai Shankar isn't holding back anymore on the diplomatic confrontation after his quote-unquote political convenience can't determine response to terror comment at the UN General Assembly. He directly spoke out on Canada at a conversation in New York organized by the influential think tank Council of Foreign Relations. This comes at a time when Indian intelligence apparatus has been reiterating evidence it has on several alleged Khalistani terrorists in Canada. Mr. Jay Shankar pointed out to evidence shared by India along with extradition requests. Very frankly, uh, what, we, uh, what we told the Canadians, uh, one, we told the Canadians that uh, this is not the government of India's policy. Two, we told the Canadians saying that, look, if you have something specific, if you have something relevant, you know, let us know. We are open to looking at it. So, but to, you know, to understand the context of it, uh, in a way, you know, because the picture is not complete without the context in a way, you also have to appreciate, Ken, that uh, in the last uh, uh, few years, uh, Canada actually has seen a lot of organized crime, uh, you know, relating to, you know, the secessionist uh, uh, forces, organized crime, violence, extremism, they're all very, very deeply mixed up. So, in fact, we have been, you know, talking about specifics and information. We have actually been badgering the Canadians. Uh, we have given them a lot of uh, information about uh, organized crime leadership, which operates out of Canada. Uh, uh, there are uh, a large number of extradition requests. Uh, there are terrorist leaders uh, who have been identified. Uh, so uh, do understand that there is an environment out there. So that is important in a way to, uh, to factor in. If you have to understand uh, what, what is uh, uh, going on out there. And our concern is that uh, you know, it's, it's really been very permissive uh, because of uh, political reasons. Uh, so we have a situation where actually our uh, diplomats are threatened, uh, our consulates have been attacked, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and often comments are made about, uh, you know, there's interference in our uh, politics. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of this is often justified uh, as saying, well, that's how democracies work. But if there are specific pieces of evidence that they provide, the government of India will cooperate with them in terms of I mean, look, if, if somebody gives me something specific, uh, it doesn't have to be restricted to Canada. Uh, but if there's any incident which, uh, you know, is an issue, uh, uh, and somebody gives me something specific as a government, I would look at it. Of course I would look at it. Uh, my question is just in continuation to the Canada uh, topic that you addressed. Uh, what would be your response to the latest reports that have come in where uh, it is said that intelligence was shared amongst the five eyes about uh, the assassination is what they're calling it and the other thing is uh, apparently the FBI uh, has told uh, US uh, Sikh leaders that there are credible threats to them so just wanted your reaction to that. I'm not part of the five eyes. I'm certainly not part of the FBI. So I think you're asking the wrong person. So is it time to put things out in public without making allegations? And if yes, what's the consequences of that? Joining us this evening, Professor Harshvi Pant, Head of Strategic uh, Studies at the Observer Research Foundation, former Indian diplomats Veena Sikri and Skan Tayal, Terry Melewin. Milevsky, author of Blood for Blood, 50 Years of the Global Khalistan Project, journalist and commentator Daniel Boardman. Thank you all for being with us this evening on this conversation. My first question to you, Professor Harshvi Pant, the credibility of any investigation, sir, is, uh, depends on the unbiased nature of it. Given the diplomatic row and the strong statements that have been made on both sides, can we take any outcome of any investigation on face value? And is it time to put all information that's available in the public domain? Well, thank you for having me. And I think it should have been done in the first place to begin with. <clears throat> if you are 
uh, a strategic partner if you are a, a traditional democracy dealing with another democracy that faces uh, similar challenging uh, issues and challenging threats then i think it it behoves the, the governments uh, th that they deal with each other in a transparent manner in a manner that is dignified in a manner that is diplomatically acceptable and i think the way uh, mr trudeau's government has dealt with this issue uh, has certainly been uh, very problematic from the very beginning and, and i as i think dr jay shankar was pointing out uh, this is a long standing story this is not a story that begins with mr trudeau's accusations this is a story that begins with india's accusations that india has been saying that look there are problems uh, that are uh, that are festering in canada that that has an impact on what on 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 india please deal with them and this is something that we have been uh, you know that indian government that uh, india has been constantly telling uh, canada and there was a you know there was a almost a nonchalant attitude about it as if it doesn't matter as if all that matters is uh, canadian domestic politics mm -hmm. and therefore the costs that were being borne by india were so high that india has to actually take some steps when as a fellow a uh, democracy and a fellow strategic partner mr trudeau comes to the floor of 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 his parliament and accuses india of something as dramatic as he as he did mm. so i think certainly for india the time has come that uh, that canada that uh, mr trudeau comes clean on this issue and makes it apparent if he has any evidence then i think that should be shared and if the if the diplomatic engagement has to be relooked at then perhaps it, it needs to be do like we looked at from the very basics so i think we are treading on very thin ice at this point from that point i take to the co comment made by the uh, external affairs minister in the un general assembly uh, and i take this across to mr boardman sir uh, the indian external affairs minister says political convenience cannot determine the response to terror and this is a comment that has resonance from the global south do you believe that this standoff only reiterates perhaps that impression yeah i mean th this th this is one of those things where it's like it's hard to really determine you know uh, you know is he a terrorist is he just a secessionist is he an enabler is he an extremist you know it, it's going to be hard to make the comparison between him Os and Osama bin Laden or Qasem Soleimani some hardcore mass murdering constructed a, a mastermind plot we, we know of terrorist terrorist whereas Nadir is just on TV advocating for extremism supporting suicide bombing and mm. it's bad uh, i i grant you i'm not justifying his actions uh but the 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 you know the, he's not Anwar al-Awlaki he's not Qasem Soleimani he's not uh, Osama bin Laden but he he is a problem is he you know some more of a Yusuf Karadawi type figure and sort of a a someone who radicalizes people into becoming uh more and more extreme and 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 and, and that so yeah, it is a it is a complicated thing, and and I can understand India's perspective here. Uh, but th these aren't the, in my view, the big questions we need to be okay. focusing on. I mean, all countries are hypocrites when it comes to foreign policy. We all act in our own self interest. It's what we have to do. It's what we should count on other countries to do. If we're going to have a real relationship with India, the best way to understand India is India needs to act in India's self interest. And we'll do what's best for India. Okay. So a good ally would under, would say, "Here's a situation that's good for Canada, that's also good for India," right. and, and bring that together. Like this is this is what we're talking about. When it so when it comes to these sort of clandestine things, I, I think the real issue here is actually not so much what happened to take it's it's how did we get here? How did the tacit endorsement of of violence and extremism grow but, in Canada? But as that is being like said, that. when you're talking of intelligence collaboration, and I want to take this across to Veena Sikri, ma'am, uh, you know, when you're talking of intelligence collaboration, and today the intelligence apparatus in India is putting out information of potential links between Khalistani terrorists and groups like the Lashkar e Taiba, which in turn have connections with groups like the Al Qaeda. Given that whole process, do you believe that India's stand on this or India's insinuations on this will cut ice with the five eyes? Well, it will cut ice with every country. We have seen, first of all, let me point out that it has cut strong ice with our neighbors. Both Bangladesh and Sri Lanka have strongly supported and said that they know that people whom they consider terrorists, the murderers of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, uh, some of the Tamil uh, operatives uh, from the TAM, the LTTE, they are living in Canada. And all that these governments have been saying to Canada has been falling on, on deaf ears. So let me tell you quite clearly that 
a strategic partner, the essence of strategic partnership is cooperation. So if you have anything, if you think something has happened, Niger has been killed uh, and you have some evidence, give it to India. Our foreign minister has clearly said that he has received no evidence at all and he's willing to examine any evidence, any credible evidence that he receives. But credible allegations of a political link is not evidence, number one. Number two, we have seen within Canada, the leader of the opposition, the premier of uh, British Columbia, they both saying the same thing. We have seen no evidence. How has the prime minister made such statements? Thirdly, these people, Niger and of course, even uh, Gurpat Wan Singh, Panun and others, they are Canadian citizens. Some of them are also American citizens like Panun. How are the Canadian and American governments allowing these people to make statements against India, against mm. India's territorial integrity, against the sovereignty of India? And, and we have friends, we are, we are partners, we are strategic partners. So I think there's a lot of answers that have to be received uh, from the Canadian government that his own people are not believing him. His political ratings are at an all time low. And he's using this to show him the connection between people like Niger and organized crime is very very strong. I do not agree with Mr. Boardman at all. There are no good terrorists or bad terrorists. There are no degrees of terror. You know, so I think I don't agree. And uh, we know that there's a relationship between them. Niger is known to have organized terrorist camps in British Columbia, training people. We know people are going there. We have given evidence ourselves. There are Interpol red corner notices against, uh, against uh, Niger. Right. There were which the government completely ignored and gave him citizenship. So I think now having given, given him citizenship, they should answer for all the illegal activities that he has been doing. And I think India is completely within its right to cut this umbilical cord between these uh, terrorists living abroad and their assets in India because uh, it only gives them a linkage which shouldn't exist. They're but not it, our citizens anymore. As you make that point, but ma'am... Now, there's no interest in this. So... Let them look after it themselves. As you make that point, in fact, in a program just before this on this very cha very channel, Ka Cash Heed, who's the councillor of Richmond, had stated, "I want to know what has been done on the Kashmiri, uh, on the K Khalistani alleged Khalistani terrorists in, uh, in in Canada. What is what is being done on that bit, Mr. Mel M Milevsky? Would that be a question that cuts eyes in Canada? What's being done to?" You know, with the external affairs minister saying that India has shared intelligence and there are extradition requests that have been put. Uh, would that be part of the conversation? Is there a pushback on the government in Canada? Absolutely. I think the Canadians have had it just as much as the average Indian has had it with the permissive, supine, feeble response of governments of all parties in Canada uh, to the Khalistani threat. This has been going on for 40 years that we've been just basically rolling over and letting it happen. And that is how we have come to the state of play today, where we have normalized in Canada what is uh, obviously the glorification of terrorism and incitement to violence. This is n n not what most people think of as freedom of speech, the right to uh, uh, label Indian diplomats as killers and to show their pictures in their home, or offer rewards for the revelation of their home addresses in case anyone wants to go get them. Uh, it's not uh, what most people consider freedom of speech to glorify as a great man, a martyr of the Sikh nation, uh, the, uh, the, the Air India bomber uh, of 1985 who took 331 lives. It's not uh, as though uh, Canada has rules about the glorification a promotion of terrorism, which other countries do all over Europe. They've adopted new language. In Britain, they've had the uh, anti-glorification of terrorism provision uh, since 2006. Mm -hmm. Canada, by contrast, had a committee recommend such a change uh, eight years ago and did nothing about it. Mm -hmm. This feeble response, I believe, sickens mainstream Canadians just as much as it does mainstream Indians. Something, no solution. To, to this morass that we're in now between the two countries can begin without an admission by the Canadian government that we this has been going on too long, that we will start taking India's uh, concerns seriously and doing something about the glorification of terrorism. Even if you, if you say, oh, well, you're changing the laws, that's difficult. How about using your freedom of speech, Mr. Politician? How about speaking up about these outrages, for example, uh, the, the master posters of Tovinda Pana, the Kanishka bomber. Uh, what are we going to do about that if, we, if we're not even prepared 
to have the guts to come out and say, this is wrong. What about a, a, a diorama, a tableau, illustrating a life-size celebration of the assassination of Indira Gandhi in 1984? It's an endorsement of, of uh, terrorism. It's an endorsement of, of murder. And, and Canada's going to do not even speak up about it? Never mind change the law to ban that sort of behavior. At the moment, Canadian politicians are failing us all. Canadians and Indians by refusing to open their mouths and say, look, I know that this may cost me votes, I, I, I'm, but I'm not going to go to that Vaisakhi Strong. parade and smile and wave and hustle for votes while the, uh, the parade floats go by uh, decorated with pictures of gun-toting martyrs and assassins. And oh, the videos they produce about, oh, what a great thing. Nidja was one of those. Look at Nidwa, Nidja's own speeches. You may have seen him speaking at his Gurdwara, where he met his maker on June the 18th, at the Gurdwara, inside a sermon, if you will, from Mr. Nidja, in which it's all about how what a wonderful thing we did assassinated in Indira Gandhi. And praise to the suicide bomber who killed the chief minister of Punjab, Bayant Singh, in 1985. And praise for the assassins of General Vaidya, strong and so on, and that so you're on, and so strong on. Statements We've got that to you're... say something about it. Strong statements that you're making there. I want to go across to Skantayal, sir. Given that India's external affairs minister has now openly said that, look, what's been done about the extradition request, we can do something only if you share evidence. And given this row has played out for more than a week now, do you see it escalating further as we go along? Or do you see some kind of de-escalation? I think it will be a long process, but uh, escalation may not be there. But the real thing is that the issue is not the whatever happened to Niger and who killed him, etc. The real issue is why Canada has become a sanctuary for terrorists and those forces which want to dismember friends of Canada. Mm. And this that uh, Mujib's assassins are hiding there, LTT operatives are there, mm. Khalistanis are there. So the good outcome from all these false allegations of uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau may be that the Canadians themselves have a look on their own policies on that why has their country become such a haven mm. and how can they allow these forces to openly attack and try to dismember a friendly country. Mm. So that is they're a democratic country and hopefully they will have internal corrections. But the real issue and Canada can take action. We all remember when Americans requested that Huawei, Meng Wanzhou, that uh, she should be uh, she, uh, arrested in Vancouver because there was some uh, uh, extradition request from uh, America. Hmm. Then Canadians arrested her. Hmm. But if there are extradition requests from Bangladesh for the assassins of Mujibur Rahman, if there are extradition requests 18 from India, for terrorists and assassins, then Canada does not take action. And this is what Jashankar, our Foreign Minister Jashankar said, that some countries, the days when a few nations set the agenda and expected others to fall in line are over, that Canada cannot have this double standard, that if America makes a request, then they will arrest that lady, or whatever may be her nationality. But if India requests, if Bangladesh requests, if uh, uh, Sri Lanka requests, then they will not take action. So perhaps this is the time for Canadian politicians, Canadian society to look at themselves. That what have they become? And I'm taking this beyond just Canada, sir, to Professor Pant. We're running short of time, but Professor Pant, quickly, do you believe that this could potentially be that moment where India pushes back? And it's perhaps a message across to the rest that, look, political convenience cannot determine the response to terror and also as... Uh, the external affairs minister said in the UN General Assembly that rule makers cannot expect rule takers to quietly just follow. Dominant nations can't just follow the agenda. I mean, the other nations can't just follow the agenda set up by the dominant nations. Well, I think certainly this is a time when a lot of, uh, you know, the rules uh, that, uh, that have been made in the past are in the spotlight and the rule makers are also under the spotlight uh, as to uh, how those rules are implemented. So increasingly, I think Global South is asking when you say rules based order, whose rules are we talking about and how are those rules implemented? And I think increasingly uh, we will see that contestation being played out in, on global platforms on bi in bilateral relations. And I think in some ways, Mr. Trudeau has done a service 
uh, to this conversation because he has put the spotlight squarely on this very difficult conversation that at times strategic partners like India and Canada have not been having with each other openly. Okay. Now, I think by putting this out in the open, we are, we are now having such an open debate. And I think this is quite liberating in some ways. Hopefully, uh, Canada and India both will come to terms with it and will be able to take forward some positive actions on the, in this way. Quick responses first from you, Veena Sikri. Uh, do you believe that uh, uh, the rest of the Five Eyes uh, would potentially involve themselves in this and this could perhaps redefine the way the world is approaching this problem? No, I don't think so. I think that uh, Canada has been quite isolated. Uh, they were isolated even in the G20 because they wanted to bring it up there. And even we know in the G7 meeting, which uh, was after the G20 meeting, again, they tried to bring this up. And again, uh, you know, we do know uh, that countries like France and, and Japan and Italy, they pushed back and they were not going to do right. it. In fact, this issue has probably divided uh, the Five Eyes and the G7 uh, more than any other issue. But I think uh, this focus on uh, truth and sincerity in bilateral relations. This is very important. We cannot call out certain forms of terrorism and allow other forms of terrorism to exist and by their own citizens. And this is a point that we have to bring back uh, to them and we have to have very strong and serious conversations on them. I, Without any kind of uh, uh, proof, you cannot accuse a friendly country like India. I'm completely running out of time. David Boardman, very quickly, do you believe that this will escalate further or do you believe there will be a pullback? Daniel. I mean, I see a bunch of outs that are that Canada can take and India can take to to a productive bilateral relationship. I don't have any faith in Justin Trudeau in a coalition with Jagmeet Singh to take any of those outs. So I, I consider those two to be highly antagonistic, to have started the problem, to be driving the problem, and to continue to drive it until they're out of office. Right, Skan Tayal. So say that I don't think that uh, any relief can come from this thing uh, to do the. The uh, people of Canada will have to ask questions. The parliament will have to ask questions. Media will have to ask questions. So we should keep the pressure up and through media, through all our friends, uh, friends and the five eyes also, right. we should clearly explain to all our, our four uh, other five eye friends that what exactly is happening and India's security is threatened. So right. they should put pressure on Canada to take some action. I'm, I'm completely out of time, Milevsky. Mr. Milevsky, final word from you. I would say that we may have to wait for the next Prime Minister of Canada to really get marching down a, the path to a better, to bring this ship into safe harbor and move on. We need a reset, but it may take a new Prime Minister to do it. And the way we're going, the current, current Prime Minister's time may be up if he doesn't produce the goods and show us the evidence. Well, the economic fallout will also be huge for that country. Thank you all for joining us and sharing your thoughts on this. Uh